So hi everybody. This is the Woodstock Recite Group meeting for its monthly poetry whatever. Uh, we're getting started a little late here because there's been some confusion. But to set the record straight, we are now ready to go. I had some notes here, but maybe fortunately I can't find them, but I see them out of the corner of my eye, and I'll be getting them now. Fill up the space, somebody. Oh, I guess it didn't work. The space stayed dead. So I'm supposed to tell you because the, oh, I know what we'll do here. And this will probably be the end of my career here, Macy, with this one. But the powers that be usually have a standard kind of soliloquy that they deliver at the openings of these sessions. However, they seem not to be here today, and we're getting a late start because uh, we even fortunately found Macy because he was not alerted of this change. So all of us are starting a little bit late, and they've asked me to moderate in its place, which is not always a wise decision. So I'm going to repeat some of the crap that I thought was funny before, but here we go again. So I always like this line. So I'm old Bobby Burgess, and I'll be your host tonight, just like Colbert or whoever else the hell you watch, Russ. Oh, sorry, I forgot I was on camera. They'll be doing this archivally. It'll be all over the Internet. No wonder Gavin left the room. Nobody's laughing. That's not a good sign. Anyway, I had written here, because we thought it was funny, but now it may not be, that Danelle has had it with the usual motley crew and has flown the coop, given the business to me. So here we go. Uh, everything is supportive here. We invite new poets who have not come before. We accept most anything as long as it's original and feels authentic to the writer, be it a song, be it prose, be it poetry. And we all be, in spite of my own tone, quite, quite supportive. I've also instituted a new thing here, which I shared with everybody, which is especially important when the group is larger and has more new folks. Though I'm happy to say we've had Rhoda here, who has had more guts than most of us and has come up and entertained us for at least 10 minutes with wonderful Chinese poetry, while nobody else, including myself, would dare get up because the cameras weren't here, nothing was ready to roll. So in that spirit, we try and make this supportive for everyone, meaning that anyone who comes up here gets a big hand right off, especially when we haven't heard what you're saying yet. And at the end of it, if you clap, that's up to you and whatever you heard now, isn't it? There's a dead space. I've told you about the sheet, so we're not going to go over that again. There will be a big anniversary celebration of some sorts in the next recite. Uh, wait to see what comes in your emails if you've written your address down, because they're doing like a fourth year anniversary of the recite group. So that should be some more fun and games than the usual uh, dark life and death poetry that appropriately pervades most poetry groups that are peopled with folks over 20. Uh, fortunately, I think I'm coming to the end of my notes. Macy, have I forgotten anything that you think is crucial? Oh, I see some folks smiling here, so maybe there are some other contributions. Does anyone 
have anything to say about uh, anything before we get started and listen to the program? Oh, there's self-censorship for you. So, do you want to be reading again, Rhoda, during this? Because he's got enough. You have, you know, that we've, you've had enough with it. Because oh. we've got enough time later. So if you want to later, sure. we'll fit you in with some more great Chinese poetry. Uh, there's no rules at all with this. I will probably read towards the end. Uh, does anyone feel like going next, or shall I just choose people arbitrarily? And for those of you who I don't know too well, please say your name because I'm been having a lot of senior moments today, which is quite evident already. All right, that means I'm I'm going to call on somebody. Chuck, you in the mood? Sure. Okay, let's have a hand for Chuck Gunderson. Thanks. Early April rain in Pomfret. Cold, straight down rain falling, bare brown earth, patches of snow, wood smoke and mist in the trees on the hillsides. Cold, cold, muddy brown water, white capped, rushing under the bridge. Black bark and lichen green branches dripping. No sound except rain falling and brook running. Kind of a Chineseish poet. Oh my God. This one, um, when I first gave it a title, it was called The Written Word. And then this afternoon I decided uh, the title should be Writing Something. And I. Um, I always remember uh, that the French poet Paul Valéry said that no poem is ever finished, only abandoned. And, and looking at this poem, I realized that it's probably 10 years old, but it wasn't finished, and I ch had to change the line. And then I did, and after I changed the line, I realized it didn't need the line that I had originally written or the one that I changed, so I took them out. So it's called Writing Something, I think. Look at all the stars up there. You can thank me for them. I invented them, created them from nothing, and distributed them the way they are. At first, I tried to spread them evenly, brush away clumps and gather them together where they were too sparse. But I found I liked it the way they were, and I had to turn my attention to other things anyway. There was so much to do. Of course, I'm not finished, but I didn't know what I wanted when I began, and even now I'm not really sure. But when I look up, I'm encouraged. This one is called The Need to Say Something. I made it snow, and then I wrote the Paul Bunyan tales for you. I wrote 37 plays. 144 sonnets, shimmy shimmy coco bop, the ginger man and the song of Roland. I made a movie and built us a castle, sailed the seven seas and all the rivers, creeks and bays. I established a civilization. I wrote Moby Dick for you and 15 million poems so I could rhyme your name in couplets in every language known. Then I carved them all in cuneiform I threw a fastball in there for a strike, drew on the walls of the cave, painted the city of Delft, composed nine symphonies, held up a train and got away with the loot. I simmered up a fragrant potion and then brushed it on a rainbow. And when it was dry, I spun it and wove it into the words of a secret magic spell I cast to make you smile and wonder as I do, how that all could happen. It's 
skipping the rhyme. It's so much easier to skip the rhyme, ignore the meter, ignore the time. Don't bother with iams or anapest, pent or hexameter, all of the rest. Too many feet in the line, who cares? I'll use an enjambment and there's the answer to that. But I have to say really, with rules, I just can't express myself freely. It's playing tennis without a net, but it's also winning set after set. No scratching my head, no racking my brain. The poems produced with no effort or pain. It may be obscure, but I'll leave it to you to figure it out and then I'll know too what it all means. You'll explain it to me. I may be surprised, but I'll have to agree. You're right. It's a reference to leaves of grass. But I was actually thinking of someone's sweet ass. <laughs> I can't tell you how much this pleases me. I just write down my thoughts and it's poetry. So the rest of the poems I've read here tonight contain metaphors, similes, passion, and insight, tropes and allusions and classical reference, but they're all in free verse. It's my poetic preference. Jim Ryman, for the record. So I, I chose three poems tonight uh, that are from, are, are, were inspired by my childhood, which in a way was the reason I got into poetry at first, uh, to sort of try to put my thoughts down about my childhood in some way that made more sense to me than it did back then. Anyway, they're all, they all start with When I Was, so that's a When I Was series. When I was 12, I, pay, I played third base, Little League Baseball, at Fort Hale Park. Out beyond the dugout and the diamond that day, beyond the harbor and the creek and the cattails, blue water and metallic sky fused together on the horizon. On this hot and dusty day, not one kid reached first. It was a pitcher's duel. No ball, no bat hit the ball. No runners reached base. At third, I kicked the sand at my feet, just like the big leaguers did. Then I saw something. It looked fine and precious. I picked it up and sifted sand through my fingers. It was a small amber colored stone I pinched the tip between my thumb and forefinger, then laid it flat in the pocket of my mitt. It was an ancient arrowhead, chipped flint and sculpted hundreds of years ago. Then I was not on third base anymore. I was at an old Indian camp by the water and the harbor creek. I saw the bow and I heard the snap of the fine string and the arrow streaking through space right to the heart of the beast, the proud hunter and his prey coming home, right where I stood. Just then there was a loud crack, a shot right at me from home plate. The leather bound pure white ball rocketed towards me between my legs. The coach screamed, what are you doing? I looked at him and shrugged but I wasn't there to answer. Um, the next one is about my first encounter with uh, uh, Afri African-American woman. And at that time in my life, everybody was known as black people. Uh, and it's a reflection on that particular moment. Um, 
I don't know how many people remember Beulah, but it was a TV series and Beulah was the uh, African-American house maid. And um, as a kid, we would watch it all the time. Anyway, when I was in grade school, my mother would take us on the bus back to buying back to school clothes at the end of summer in the department stores downtown. I saw a black person for the first time sitting across from me. She was big with a bright red napkin tied to her head and too many bags at her feet. Too loudly, I said to my mother, that's Beulah from television. Shut up, my mother hissed. Then Beulah took me in with her dark eyes to know me better, smiling eyes full of love. And I looked at her wishing to say something. Don't stare, my mother hissed again. Why? She looks nice, I whispered back. Downtown, the bus emptied at Chartenburg's where we would shop, all except Beulah. But her eyes followed me off the bus. She smiled right at me. I watched her in the window as the bus pulled away. She opened her hand, five long fingers, and a pink and white palm waved back and forth until the bus was gone. Later in the store, I asked my mother, where is Beulah going? My mother said, to the end of the line. The next one is uh, locomotive. I conjure every detail of the day my father, the train mechanic, took me to see the monster locomotive in the shop as big as a baseball stadium where he worked on the New York, New Haven, and Hartford. Hundreds of mercury vapor lamps sparkled from the ceiling like distant stars, glimmering on the big black machine of bent metal. Greasy clouds of welding smoke and the stench of rarefied air in the gauzy film closed in around me. The iron beast hovered over me with an evil presence, dark and menacing, one big eye staring at me, bigger than any machine I'd ever seen. My father climbed way up the ladder into the engineer's cab towering over me, and he yelled down, hey, you want to hear me start her up? Below, small, timid, fearful, I screamed, no. He climbed down, gently took my small trembling hand. We went home without a word. And the last one is um, from a Vermont poet that I really like, many of you might too, from Hayden Carruth, called Cows at Night. The moon was like a full cup tonight, too heavy, and sank in the midst. Soon after dark, leaving for light, faint stars and silver leaves of milkweed beside the road, gleaming before my car. Yet I like driving in Vermont in summer, at night. The brown road through the mist of mountain dark among farms so quiet, and the roadside willows opening out where I saw the cows. Always a shock to remember them there, those great breathings close in the dark. I stopped and took out my flashlight to the pasture fence. They turned to me where they lay, sad, beautiful faces in the dark, and I counted them, 40 near and far in the pasture, turning to me, sad and beautiful like girls very long ago, who were innocent and sad because they were innocent and beautiful because they were sad. I switched off my light, but I did not want to go, not yet, nor know what to do if I should stay. For how in that great darkness could I explain anything, anything at all? I stood by the fence, and there, and very gently, the rain began to fall. Thank you. Do you have any more? Because we have time. No, not one. Okay. Thank you.
Gavin? Sure. Great. Gavin, what's that last name again? Wingfoot Fisher. There it is. Hello, my name is Gavin Wincoop Fisher. I've been absent for a while from this event and from my life. Um, coming back. And uh, I guess I'll start with the heavy one. Um, those of you who have seen me here before um, may have, you know, may be aware that uh, suicide has touched my life and um, it's one of those things that's not talked about much um, and it's uh, it's pretty highly stigmatized and I think in a way that um, is not helpful um, I think probably more people than will admit have felt that they don't want to be here that there is not a prize at the end of the struggle that is life some days. And um, I suppose in a way this, uh, this poem is an admission, but it's also um, about a turning point that is available to anyone that struggles with self-destruction. A naked man hunched haunts my mirror, all thin skin and frame angles, somehow everything recalling a sunken ship in LED illumination, pupils pouring unbattened portholes in this hulking mess beneath so much blue, desperately clutching the razor-thin chances clenched in his fist, beside his squirming life, eyes fixed in divine judgment, Mute scream reckoning, and the mirror faces the man, and the choice bleeds the moment. But in the end, the surface breaks the breath, bellows his lungs worthy. There's a glimmer there, still clinging to the mortal beast, shipwrecked treasure, or a tattered map at least. A perforated path pulls him back from the void at the border, the edge that ends all adventuring and back into the bathroom to unfold the man's self origami into something else, all besides the point being accepted by himself, still earning his sorrow as we all must, but suddenly trusting. It is all nothing until it is something. And if we find ourselves being this something, what more permission do we need? We are deserving of creation. We are worthy by our being. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. the last lines are just, uh, I think we're all meant to create. And I think if we take that away from ourselves, which many people have in this society that doesn't encourage that, um, you're flirting with destruction. Um, I had a relationship this summer for a little while um, until I couldn't because I couldn't love myself at the time. But, um, but it gave me a poem. Perfection, she's fluid. We probably didn't realize she's been happening right here in the old house with the carved molding and the clawfoot tub planted like it grew right there in a bathroom bigger than my bedroom. In fact, every room was like a bedroom or boarding room from back when junction meant more. And every room was built to hold a whole life with headroom for dreams to bloom, for a family to take root and blossom right there south of the depot, west of the river, where they loved like little critters nestled between these walls. See, perfection used to splash down these halls like the boys of June, and too she was a family belly laughing together over a thin breakfast, back when the future had a future. 
She sometimes sounded like an engine chugging along. On occasion, she built kettle steady, easing hot over the curling edge of that clawfoot tub and pressing the floor for its lows with a geological patience. Often she gathers and swirls on the peripheries of our perception like a well-polished waltz, like old tiles, fluid and gravity, or a gramophone crackling under lofty ceilings. And finally, this evening, Perfection was overheard reading astrology aloud, seen studying my face carefully and asking tall questions, somehow every one a song. And to answer each one, I spun another dusty record. Most have been around too long, but in the right room there's still a glint, some shimmering gold in my faded collection. And although our bodies begged for dancing, we lay listening intently, till perfection soothed the tension, shaking laughter from our bellies. And when that big room fell quiet, she forgave me instantly for having to ask be before passing from your lips to mine. And when my sweater was suddenly too warm, she was the open window, whispering its slow build summer, reminding me the way she was a crow that carried me awkwardly all winter and then gently set me down her tracks gone with the snow till now, somehow ghosts stamped in graceful glyphs, her clues easily perceived in the creases of joy playing on the corners of your eyes. And on my short drive I can feel, navel to spine, the afterglow of our mirth, tight tummy tremors, echoes of her already burrowed and stirring under my surface, still sifting the moments at 2 a.m., wide awake, and praying some essence of her will watermark this page. Thank you. Love's pretty great. Um, this poem has come back to me a couple times. I stumble over it, and um, I think I am gonna work on it, but as it stands, it's uh, it might even be hard for me to read here, but um, <clears throat> this poem is this poem is about hope, I guess, and uh, I think there's some stuff in it here that I was reminded of in I think your your third poem, um, maybe second poem. Anyway, but. how am I today? I'm teetering on the edge of sinking my teeth into tomorrow. Tucked wings, songbird turned dart in the dip. Be I am the second of free fall before the rope swing catches. I am the thickening space between sidelong glances. I am the stage hands sweating onto the curtain cords before sweeping them up. The pitch on the way from the mound, or maybe a bit more like a hive of hushed revolutionaries, packaging powder, grimly propelled through the winter with frosty beards, haunted by a bullet-pocked timeline, scrambling on a slippery slope soaked in the blood and spit of too many bitten lips. I am spurred into action by the surgical bludgeon of injustice. And still sometimes, I feel like a boy with a bike, sung to sleep by the peepers and awakened by the morning doves, rising to a day brimming over with nectar, the sweetest summer morning your tongue ever tasted, a sprouted seed, a cracking chrysalis, an infant crowning scarlet corona, scream of transformation, a woman tearing her nerves and body, the quintessential labor of love, to become a mother, to burst into a new being, but more than that, to become that tiny person's universe. I am the father's nails bitten to the quick, his soul's damn near worn through pacing, now heart racing, now joyous tears accumulating, as the RN summons him with thinly disguised smiles in her eyes, it's a boy. I am the mother, father, daughter, and shadow shrouded other. I am that son born and breathing again. Please wrap him in pink. Teach him to sing. Let him dance his snowflake steps through life. Let him love who and how he will. Show him not the shattering, but the wholeness in his own heart healing. 
Show him how molten gold moves in him, the glow that he possesses. Let his heart burn like stars for moonlit face reflections. Do not hide all your beauty behind the toxic clouds. You are you, and that is magic. Feel, feel your feelings. It's allowed. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I got one more, maybe. I think you've heard it before. Um, yeah, this one I wrote in the beginning of the summer before I stopped writing for the summer. Um, and this one, I don't know, it's just sort of an exploration of elements of poetry. It's kind of a collage, I guess. I'm attempting to dance to violins and crash cymbals. Following a steady stream steps a path of perforated ash and frantically searching for string. I used to connect and collect dots more often. Now I'm tying off more knots than knot and fiddling with cymbals. See if I find a crow feather in the driveway and a dream catcher in the dirt, I'm tying them both to my rear view. Where on different dots I'm sitting at a cafe in Sicily. A man is stopping to tie bright string around my wrist. He is from Senegal and smiles with his eyes. I pay too much for trinkets I don't need and still keep. We're both going home, grinning with something. And dots find me driving outside Asheville. A red sedan passes by my left, simultaneously smashing a swooping hawk. The taillights turn to red threads that lace the night and dissipate. Black wings flap and feathers fall the same way in New Hampshire. I'm passing a blue Volvo and carelessly side swipe a gentle creature, quietly searching for a home. But her apartment is half packed and fully paced, so we sit at the empty table and fumble at the knots in her throat till the gathering din at the window flaps in calling. And then we are crying. Blue threads, sorrows, strings humming a slow waltz of heartache swaying and waiting, but we are not sleeping. The barometer has dug a hole, perhaps to hide from the thunder heads, but we've been busy planting flowers and chanting for lightning, and the moon is full. We got dreams on simmer for the summer and brainstorm rainbows in our smiles, and in the morning, we're making sweet potato hash. So now I'm here, humming and swaying, Stewing, pissing, reminiscing, but my lungs are complaining in my chest behind the rain and carry on. So I resolve again to sweep the dust, dots, and ashes from that altar. Black wings flap. Summer simmers. I am toying with symbols and tying strings to everything. Thank you very much. Gavin, for what it's worth, I know it's a cliche, but I trust you'll understand what I mean with everything. Just keep on coming back and all that stuff. And uh, I don't speak for everyone, but certainly for myself, is we're all there a lot with the same stuff. So unfortunately, nobody's alone. We're all there. That's why the stuff. A lot of times. Us? You want to cut some stuff? Anything to read? Up to you. No. Rather no, just listen. Ready yet. Cool. Okay. <clears throat> Is it time, Peter? I guess it's time. I think it's time. <coughs> it's a nice line from the lace plan. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can feel it. <laughs> when the bartender says, hurry right up, it's time. Hurry right up, it's time. And I can see. Caroline is circling the room, thinking of Michelangelo. Oh, yes. Sorry to use you this way, but it goes with the <laughs> I'll be paying for that at home. Anyway, Peter Fox Smith.
October rains. There is an epigraph underneath the title. I've taken the last line of Homer from his Iliad. Such was the burial of Hector, breaker of horses. The bay and chestnut mares stand still among the brown and broken grass recently so green and rich upon the hill. As now October days do pass and leaves by biting rains are driven down in all their furious colors spinning to the end of their days. Now the old town attends the end's new beginning as tall snows hover in the graying clouds and wait to speed the dying. Soon it is done, but none of us admit aloud what we are or that without trying we expect to live forever. Dumb, gentle horses stand, big-headed, dark-eyed, grazing, and I have left but barren ash on barren land and icy winds for grazing. And that was the burial of Hector, breaker of horses? Not at all. Honored was he of men and gods. You can be sure that only my dreams of death have you heard. Hovering winds, go with me to endless days or day's end when my ghosted self outruns these brittle bones and with its blathing lungs meekly blows into your long-winged arms. Around the town's sad breast we'll go, collecting leaves and leaving leaves to be beaten by October rains into the hilly sod. Endlings. An endling is the last known individual of a species. Once an endling dies, the species becomes extinct. This is a poem I wrote for Geza Tatralie, who is a friend of mine, and those of you that come regularly know Geza, who is in Europe until Christmas time. Out of nothing, back to nothing on our old orb, for breaths between the birthing scream through life as dreams, bad or good, to death unredeemed. And yet, with love, then better seems life as a dream, though quite unreal, when human minds which conquered space must Share disgrace of having caused Mother Earth to mother no more with all deceased. What about love? Queries cry. What can such love do? Tint life's shadows less obscure? Yes. Solve all problems? No. Yet lessens pain in life as dreams. To yield a happy moment or two, or to alter only, but briefly, bad dreams. Love cannot undo all the everlasting wrong. Human thirsts satiated constantly do. But to have love, such love cannot be something bought by lucre's schemes wooed by mutual means, nor could it ever deny, we willed our doom. 
Love cannot restore dodos, bring back the passenger pigeons, untold amphibians to sight just one, fringed limbed tree frogs, or lonesome George, a tortoise type, last of its kind, Pinta Island Galapagos. Love can't contain methane, reduce global warming, revert destroyed habitat, nor does love undo what dire we've done. Our species with brains which can think, supposedly knowing cause and effect, right from wrong, for better from worse, by brains comprehending that E equals MC square, such worthy brains are overpowered by selfishness, by mindless mobs, by massive greed, perpetrating our lonely Earth's inanimate, inglorious demise to dust to spin and roll around the sun so lifelessly because billions of the homo sapien kept procreating wildly at will, making billions more possessed of unquenchable appetites for food, land, water, making homeless countless creatures from big to small, from buzz to bite, fly to crawl, and eventually our frail planet could not sustain us all, and thus over and done is life on earth, done in by too many people. We authored Mass Extinction number seven, or number six, the number doesn't really matter. Now it is over. Tutto fini. Somewhere, moonlight lies glimmering silver shine on a far strand or rustling waters on wasted earth with a poor old man in the moon wondering Oh, where have all the lovers gone? Then sobbing, ponders, where have all the moon gazers gone? Where can they be? And tides, my tides, no one to see tides ebb, tides flow. There's no one left to measure tides. Geza asked me for a copy of that. I emailed it to him. He emailed me right back and said, we obviously are two souls traveling the same way. I just yesterday wrote a haiku about the moon and what Geza had written probably the same day that I finished the last part of this poem about the moon. He wrote a haiku. The man in the moon sees the smog clogging our air. He laments our fate. Geza always has an ability, which I don't have, to say a lot with only a few words. It takes me a lot more words than that. In Geza's absence, I want to share two of his poems with you. He very nicely asked me to write the foreword to his book, which is just out, Extinction. And the first paragraph of my foreword I'm going to read to you. Nearly 50 years ago, Geza Tatralye and I could have passed each other unwittingly in Harvard Yard, but we did not meet until reading at a poetry recitation in Vermont 
two years ago. Immediately, I recognized similarities in our concerns pertaining to the perilous, irresponsible human condition, the fate of our planet, and for everything that lives upon it. And I told him I'd like to read two of his poems, and would he choose them? And he said, no, I'd like you to choose them. And when I told him the two that I chose, he said, those are the two I would have chosen. The first is the title poem in his book, Extinction. I can picture the mighty mastodon, the towering ivory hairy beast that ruled and roamed this primeval earth. The fierce dinosaurs of the Jurassic, those huge, cold-blooded reptilian beasts battling each other for primacy. Through the microscope of my failing mind, in the imagined black hole of creation, I see tiny, single-celled organisms, the chemical precursors to all life. I ask, when humankind is no longer, who or what will conceive this strange being that destroyed Earth and all life, including itself, as if it had been preordained. And the last poem of Gezus that I selected is called Witching Hour. Is this the witching hour, the turning point, when the simmering seas boil, spill across the cauldron, bring to flood this verdant earth, corpses of frogs and fish, seals and birds, are detritus, plastics, and rotting hulls wash up with the silt to bury my feet. Is this the witching hour, the turning point, when wildfires spread, raging across the land, and consume forests and fields, roads and towns, killing with burning heat and acrid smoke all life they find in homes or barns or nests, or frantically fleeing the fated end? Is this the witching hour, the turning point? We know damn well it is, but do nothing. We continue our hedonistic lives, complicit in destroying our one Earth. Gaze's book can be purchased at the local bookstore. I'm sure he'd be willing to sign it for you if you have any interest in doing what I do, and that is buying books of fellow poets. And he'll be back by the beginning of the year. And Geza, we missed you. Thanks for your patience in uh, the awkward start to this program because we had to overcome a lot of um, unexpected dilemmas. Um, I feel like we've made up for it with a certain kind of uh, consistent intensity that 
is sometimes absent from the more frivolous other recites I've been a part of. And I appreciate the depth of the stuff coming out. So, let's, I got a few things to end this with. Um, some of you may have heard some of this stuff before. I call them oldies but goodies. From looking at, I guess, the universal fun subjects as we've heard all night of uh, life and death. Sometimes I wonder why I dare to get up here and do this. Who the hell am I anyway to get up here and carry on like I'm somebody special? Who thinks he knows more? Who gets to preach to you? Impress you with precious poetry? Swollen words? What is it anyway, Caroline, that you want to hear? Something to move your soul, delight your ear? Why even bother? You've heard it all before. No matter how hard you cry, no matter what you do or think or write or say, both you and I are still gonna die no matter how many times we all ask why. So better enjoy that banana cream pie while you're still able to get to the table, while you're still able to walk and talk and hear this sorry ass fable before we all go bye, bye, bye. Moving right along and in the same happy vein. Here's another little something, a little Meditation, as they call it up here. With a little help from me old friends, the Willies. If you knew you would die tomorrow, what would you do? Pray for this old world. Trust that the Lord watches over you. Think of all the things you were supposed to do, but never got around to. Finally say, I love you, before it's too late, if you're lucky enough to still have someone to call your mate. Gather loved ones all around for that final hand-holding, heartfelt wake. What else can you do? Apologize to everyone you ever done wrong. Get stone drunk and curse your fate. Sit there numb in a state of shock. Hug the dog for all you're worth and meditate. Eat that last supper for all you can taste. Watch that old TV one last night before this very final commercial break. Maybe it's better not to know. Suffer mortal surprise. Slip back into nothingness. Go gentle into that good night. Maybe better not to know. Knowledge often a curse. Ignorance is bliss. Awareness often works. Does any of it matter? What do you think? 
one way or the other. What fools we mortals be. Is time, time itself, not truly, as old Willie Boy says, the mercy of eternity? Or as the other Willie is wont to say, we are such stuff as dreams are made on and our little life is rounded with a sleep. So, thank you. But I ain't asleep yet, folks. I got one more. <laughs> so to end this little poetic exercise, play within a play, indulgence in words, 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 as old Shakespeare used to say. To end this with a call to arms and action instead of idle talk and all this precious contemplation. Can we simply say that life is tough? And if you live long enough, you won't be able to fool yourself anymore as to who you think you really are. So wake up already and do something different before it's all over and done with. Do it now. Thanks for listening. Thank you all for, you know, making what had a shaky start for all of us uh, seem to be something that in the best sense feels like some kind of good goddamn group therapy. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sal. Thank you.